I'm your host, Joey McGee, a.k.a. Gojin the Makai Phantom. Joining me once again is Forgotten Pharaoh. Hello. Cody Bratch. Mika Nakrista. And Hooper. Uh-huh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Trev Thomas is supposed to join in too, but we'll have to see. He's probably sleeping. But... Hey, Hooper, I got a question for you. Mm-hmm. Are you a Godzilla fan? Do I look like one? <laughs> I mean, that kind of looks more like Zilla than Godzilla, so that's debatable. Oh, no. His name was on the box, Sar. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, but his name has changed. Oh, oh here that, comes. That, that You're in fight. You're in fight. You're in dead. <laughs> no. Yeah, all right. <laughs> but anyway, um... If anyone's confused on the last time that happened, um, we came to Twitch. Like, I'm experimenting with the Twitch thing so I could have a place to live stream the podcast while also to uploading them on YouTube with slight edits to get a bit more polish on them. But essentially, when it comes to this stupid website, you have to go into a setting that saves the broadcast. And luckily, I went into that setting, so now this should and will save as a video on demand, so I'll be able to do what I want with it. But yeah, that's why um I if you do missed what I it the last do what I want. <laughs> but that's why if you missed it, the last attempt at podcast for episode 30 of Galactic Nerd Outpost, it was this website being fucking dumb. Like if you don't want your broadcast to save, you should have to turn it off. You shouldn't have to turn it on to have them to save. I'm just saying. But that said, um here we are going to be taking a look at a few different movies that came out recently. This year being Shin Ultraman, being the oldest because it came out in Japan, but recently got leaked online. Um, Hellraiser, and uh, what's the other? Oh, Werewolf by Night. Mm-hmm. What we're looking at first, in honor of Pharaoh, well, is Hellraiser. We got <laughs> sights to show you. <laughs> <laughs> you go first, Pharaoh. Uh, all right. So no, no spoilers. Just kind of basic overview. What do you think? Yeah, basic overview first, and then after final thoughts and rating for it, we can go. <laughs> okay. So let me preface saying I was never really interested in the Hellraiser series. I said it last time. Also, I'm fascinated by body horror, but I'm not really interested in watching it. Also, to preface, I was a vet tech for a couple years. I have seen dogs' eyes taken out of their head, spleens taken out. I've seen cats with, like, cancerous tumors the size of majority of their bodies. It's disgusting. I've poked at it. I've, like, taken, like, I've taken, like, cells of it apart and sent it off to labs. I've poked what an eyeball feels like. Very, very squishy. I've taken teeth out of pet smiles. I'm okay with gore. I'm not okay with people or things in pain, apparently. And that's a lot of Hellraiser. It, it, it kind of feels like it starts off slow. That's because I get bored. But I will say, whatever those Cenobite things are, interesting body horror things. I will say that like it felt like a Hellraiser movie to the point of, this is uncomfortable seeing these people in pain, but I do like the designs they have done with these things. I've also renamed all of them for my own fun sake of it. So there was the Skin Flay Franny. There was the Chitty Chat Kathy or Chitter Christy. Then there was Jawless Jesse, uh, Wheezing Wendy, and then Pinhead Pamela. Pinhead Pamela. Okay, I remember <laughs> that. I, that. I was having way more fun with the movie. And every time they show up on screen, I was like, hey, it's them. Uh, but that being all said, I would say it's fun. If you're interested in gory kind of movie where it has that nice body horror with <clears throat> kind of ca- with characters you don't really root for. I will say I never rooted for the main characters once. But overall, I'm like, this is a solid, like, C movie, just because I don't care. If you're interested in Hellraiser, it probably gets a higher rating. That's just my own bias, though. It was interesting. I wouldn't have watched it if it wasn't for the stream, though. I blame you. You might get ducks if I ever find out your address, Joey. I promise you <laughs> that. <laughs> hey, I like ducks. Nah, these. You don't want 50 rubber ducks on your doorstep. Those are ducks of war, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Did ducks. Joey, Jimbo, if he, I love ducks. I would tell you about it. Joey, if he does send you the ducks, you definitely gotta teach him how to play hockey. Yeah. <laughs> but like, I don't, I don't. 
if I was to say my spoiler-free thoughts on this movie, mm-hmm. I liked it. I mean, it's definitely one of the Hellraisers that actually feel like a movie. Like, I only watched the first three, but I've seen the Decker Shadow reviews of the others, and outside of the opinions he gave that were very fleshed out, the movies just look very poorly made. A lot of the sequels do, but that's because they have a thing where a lot of them were not meant to be Hellraiser originally. They were going to be com- something completely different, but at the last minute, to make more money, they decided to throw the Cenobites in the script in a lot of these sequels. Um, <coughs> me personally, when I was watching them all, I stopped after the third because the first two great movies, in my opinion, the third, I remember being pretty fucking bad, but then I heard it goes downhill Bitch. from there. <laughs> but then there is this one. This one is a interesting case as the director apparently considers it more of a more of the tenth entry, I think, more so than a reboot. So maybe it would be a mix of both. Like it would definitely be some heavy retcons considering what the Cenobites look and sound like. But I could see it. Um as for the story, it I feel like there is a connection of each style that we're looking for here, like you have that supernatural aspect from the first two movies where the Cenobites are more subtle, doing all these um, outlandish stuff, combined with the more slasher film aspect of the third movie, which I didn't like the third movie, as I said. But the third Bitch. movie, I do, I am glad that there seem to have been some elements from that put here when it comes to how the Cenobites behave, combined with um, the first two movies. This definitely does seem to be very well done for what it is. Like, a lot of people complain about the woke pinhead, but it's like, and the original... Her name is Pamela, sir. Pamela. (laughs) But the thing is, when it comes to the original source, like, not the movies, but the books, Pinhead is supposed to be a very outlandish demon, so Pinhead has... um, Okay. (laughs) I I want to say every single time. (laughs) <laughs> let's, let's, let's just call her Pam Head. Yeah, All right. Okay. okay Pam Head. But in the original source material, um, Pam Head is supposed to have um, traits from both male and female sense. It's a demon, so there's a lot of crazy stuff. So I personally think casting a trans person was actually a really good casting choice for the character. As, as much as I love Doug Bradley... I do see what they were going for more by going with um, closer to the book in that respect. And the actress, in my opinion, captured a lot of Doug Bradley's subtlety. I think she did a very good job there. Still, Doug Bradley is my preferred choice, but I still thought that she definitely took a lot of inspiration from him in the right cases. Characters, on the other hand, they're serviceable. They got motives. Friends clearly care about the lead girl to stick around (laughs) after all of this. But in the end, they're still kind of basic. And I don't think the majority of people are going to remember who they are. And the effects definitely are very... Very impressive. You got very detailed gore, blood. Shatter has them very smooth <clears throat> movements with his mouth and everything around it. Like the outlandish worlds the Cenobites are able to create. Like I can't go into it yet since we're not in the spoiler aspects, but you get the outlandish demonic world and some pretty solid detail here. And I gotta say, I respect that. But yeah, I liked it, but. It's not perfect, but I'll get into more of the imperfections as we dive more into the spoiler section. So I guess I'll go next. Go yeah. for it. All right, cool. So I I enjoyed it, but I feel like the same way Joey did, which is like I don't think I would watch it again. You know what I mean? Like it's one of those things. Like it actually made me want to watch the original one more for some reason because I haven't seen the original Hellraiser in a good while. About like three three years ago was the last time I watched it. I got up to two and then I never watched the sequels afterwards because I tried like watching three and I just, I couldn't get through it for some reason. I don't know. Just Hell Ranger. You. Hell, oh, Hell you. Ranger three for some reason bored me so much. I was just like, oh, hey, look, Fright Night's on. I'm going to watch Fright Night. So yeah. that's what happened. But yeah, like I like the first two because I think the first two are really onto something. And then I think over time, the concept just got lost. But then again, like Joey said, they were supposed to be completely different movies. And then you just became Hellraiser because Doug Bradley still wanted to show us more sights, apparently. Anyway, <laughs> so, uh, but. Yeah, it's just like I thought Pam Head was interesting. But like again, I do like that they're going more to the source material. That is cool that they went back there. But in execution, I felt like something was off. Again, like the charis I felt like the charisma was not there. 
Like that, that's the problem I felt was missing was like the charisma Doug Bradley had in the first movie was closer to the charisma pinhead or yeah. Pinhead had in the, in the book, even though, you know, pinhead was androgynous kind of like it was both male and female as a demon. So up a bit. Yeah. And I just, I think just better, like, okay, which one sells the execution of the character more? Well, I'd say, well, okay. Even though the detail is more accurate in personality, I think the Hellraiser from the first movie, I mean, or I mean, Pinhead from the first movie was the better demon. So, uh, and going with the other extra characters in the movie, I, I felt they were by the numbers that that's the way, like, you know, basically me and Joey are kind of on the same book with the extra characters. Like they do their part, but because they do their part, they don't really add anything else much. They're just like, okay, we're here to support the lead character. Yeah. They're, they're, they're cannon fodder. Yeah, yeah they're by yeah. the numbers cannon fodder, you know? Yeah, uh, pretty much there to die. Yeah, we're just like, we're we're here to be killed on camera, and that is all you're going to remember us from. We're just going to, we're going to be death number one, two, and however many left over, you know? <laughs> so yeah. that's, that's, that's just kind of it, and that's, I don't know, I think that's disappointing. Like, that's the problem with a lot of slasher, like, not even just slasher movies, but I mean horror movies now, like, you know, even like that new Halloween movie they did. I didn't remember any of the extra characters. All I remembered was, oh, yeah, Michael killed him. Oh, yeah, he died. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, she did. That, that's, you know, it's not, it's not yeah. like these horror movies, like, where it's like, oh, I remember her because, you know, she had a fear of this, and then he, she got killed, and she was, oh, I was hoping I would have got to see her stay alive, and I, I think what happened is just, like, there's a lack of personality somewhere, like, it's just, like, they're trying too hard to make some of these characters the everyman, I think, or just the every woman. And then they just become so bland that the only thing you remember is the death. Although that could be on purpose too. They could have just set these up as like, Oh no, these are just going to be actors to be for a, you know, extravagant death scene in this movie. And that's it. Yeah, so in, in order for that to work, you need to have extravagant deaths. Everyone kind of dies the same way. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, yeah that's, that's that's the problem. Like they just they 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 die the same way. And uh, going on to the gore, which you mentioned, uh, Faro, the the gore in Hellraiser never bothered me that much. I'll say like the first time I watched it, the hooks and stuff kind of like unnerved me because I remember getting a hook in my hand once and Ooh. having to get that out was a nightmare. It was it was a it was when I was a kid. It was a fishing hook, but just I remember that freaked me out. And then I saw yeah. that it kind of brought back some painful memories. I was like, Ugh. you know, <laughs> but yeah, after my hand multiple times, it fucking sucks. Yeah, it does. And then after, you know, after I watched the first one stuff, I was just like, yeah, like it's okay. Hooks, whatever. But yeah, the first time I watched it, it like freaked me out. But um, no, the, the gore in Hellraiser doesn't bother me too much, but I, I really felt like just creatively the deaths are really lacking compared to the first ones. Like just the first one, the second one, you know, cause it was very out there. I mean, it was like trying to do like Freddy Krueger's dream death scenes, but take it up a notch a little bit. Yeah, it was creative. So, yeah. I yeah. didn't think of that until you mentioned it, but you're right. A lot of the deaths were lacking, but there was one that when we will get into spoiler section later that I did really like, but I like, but that revolves around a twist, which is why I can't say it. I don't remember. Till, till yeah. Later. Yeah. What a twist. <laughs> yeah, you know what been the real twist of the movie? Well, this would have been hilarious now. I just thought about this. Wouldn't it be funny if the whole movie, like the reason like it just it wasn't a good Hellraiser movie was because it was just a nightmare Freddy made up and he's like screwing with someone in their dream. Oh, you know what? <laughs> nightmare, I got a Hellraiser remake. <laughs> that would be surprising. I'll give you that. That would be hilarious. <laughs> Welcome to Prime Time, bitch. <laughs> yeah. Or no, 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 wait, wait. <laughs> Welcome to Disney Plus, bitch. Jesus. <laughs> it's not Hulu. Whatever. Hulu. Be, um, I know, but right. I, just, I think Disney Plus would be funnier. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> but how about you, um, Cody? What's your spoiler-free thoughts? Well, first of all, Hellraiser 3 is my favorite Hellraiser movie, you fucking assholes. Fuck all of y'all. <laughs> what did I do? I never watched it. Come at me, Exactly bro. the problem. Oh, okay, I'll take that. I'll take your ire for saving myself time. Okay, but seriously, though, no. I consider myself 
a casual fan of the Hellraiser franchise. It's not one of my favorite things, but I find the concepts explored in it fascinating. And also, that Doug Bradley has pinhead, though. that that That's some good stuff. Having said all that, I still feel like I should have been informed for this review, so I did some research into what all is going on, and what do I think of the movie as is? It's fine. I find it to be an adequate Hellraiser film, and I like it movies such as Greed, Lust, Desires, Stations, Selfishness, and basically the consequences of such. Even though the characters they used for it weren't, like, the best, like, the most interesting, you know, and even one, one was there to explore the themes. One of them was just there to, to be camp fodder, even more so than everyone else. Like, she died, was just there to die to did it. And died it, did, she did. But even so, I liked the tone. I liked the atmosphere. The musical score was enjoyable. And the Cenobites, definitely the show stealers in every scene they were a part of. And the Hell Priest in this movie, I found, I really enjoyed. I thought... Even though she wasn't Doug Bradley, she still had the same gravitas that she that Doug Bradley brought to the role while still trying to do her own thing. The charisma thing, I guess I can agree with Huber on that, but I still found her performance as the help be adequate, and the Cenobites are just visually stunning mm -hmm. in their presentation. And... Even though I said in a past uh, live stream I would miss the le BDMS inspired leather robes, apparently yeah. the Cenobites as they appeared in this movie are actually closer to what they looked like in the original book. So there's that. And also the Helpry has a robe of sorts on her about her. So she still has a visual appearance that still invokes the, the idea of what the original Pinhead was in the first movie and onwards. So overall, I like the movie, but it is still heavily flawed as you guys characters weren't that interesting mm. despite them being used as vessels to explore the, the themes the movie was going for. But I still appreciate uh, this movie's interpretation of, Bake, of Clive Barker's original concepts. Fair. When it comes to scores, before we get into spoiler stuff, I'll give it a 7 out of 10. I re the effects was really good. Um, I thought that people who, had, uh, people who played the Cenobites did a great job, and the special effects used for their presentation were outstanding. But uh, the characters, as we said, wasn't really anything too good. Um, they were okay. Um... And as a whole, the kills weren't really the best. But yeah. that said, solid yeah. movie, and I do recommend it if you want to see another <laughs> Hellraiser movie. It's not great, but definitely the best to come since Hellraiser 2, to my understanding. I'll say that too, honestly. As someone who doesn't watch Hellraiser things, it feel if you want to see something Hellraiser-based, or you want to see something for Halloween, give this one a shot. It has some creepy elements near the end where it's like, oh... If all of Hellraiser was, like, the last end of this movie, I feel like this would have been really, like, a lot creepier then. Yep. <laughs> anyway, next. Uh, who, who gives the ratings next? I guess I'll give mine. Uh, I'll also go with 7 out of 10. It was sufficient and made for the most part. Yeah. Okay. Uber? I guess... <laughs> Six out of ten. Like, I mean, I it was all right. Like, it was it was good, but like, I just don't see myself coming back to watch it. So that's like, it's I don't know. Maybe like, if I give it more time to like think on it more, then I'll come back to it and be like, oh, this is better than I remember. You know, it's just I feel like it's one of those movies like you watch once, but you don't watch it multiple times. You know what yeah. I mean? So yeah. it's like you feel like a group of friends are around. It's like, oh, it's Halloween. Let's put this on while we do something else. Yeah. Okay. Right on. I'll give it a C. I, I, I've realized my number system isn't very effective, so I'm just going to do like ABCs for a bit because I'm better with that. I'll give it a C. ABC, as easy as one, two, three. <laughs> nah, when they see basically better be, with letters and numbers. When a C basically be equal to a five? No. One, one to make more. 
I don't know. See, that's why my number system is a little weird to go through. Where it's like a C is like, you know, if you got a C on something, it's like you passed. Mm. But you could have done better. Okay, so slightly good. So like a six or seven. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't it make more sense, though, to be like, one, two, I got some great sights to show you. <laughs> wouldn't that make more sense? <laughs> I guess maybe I like I'm still trying to rework it around one through 10 feels like a lot to go through where it's like me like I'm still figuring out I just kind of I just wrote down uh credit uh yeah I just wrote down overall evil genies grants wish but screws you over C yeah. also the star credit to credit to them to making the easiest puzzle box to solve which leads to more victims because technically yeah. speaking that's a pretty smart idea yeah so, in terms of spoilers, something I will say on the characters, I stand by everything I said about them, but in terms of spoilers, I will say the setup to them is good, like how the leading girl, I can't remember her name because, again, they're not memorable. Riley. So, Riley. Oh, yeah. it, like, for example, she was just getting drunk, got into a fight with her brother, which led to her to go out and do reckless shit with the puzzle box, mm -hmm. and that eventually her recklessness of being hurt eventually led to him going to find her and him get it in his eventual death. Mm -hmm. And through Which that, we don't see. Yeah, yes. That's part of the but problem with the kills. It's like half of, them, half of them you don't see on screen. Like that's why they seem lacking in my opinion, is because half of them are off screen. Yeah. But once he is taken, there is a valuable reason for his growth, uh, for her growth there. As granted, she does do reckless stuff. As I think, like she kind of goes in to try to fight all the Cenobites to get her wish done. She's not particularly a good person, but no one in this movie's a good person. Let's be honest here. Her friends, all right, understandably, Riley is a drug addict. We see that fairly simple. On she has a drug problem. Her friends are yelling at her screaming he's like what happened what happened like i don't know i was messed up and they're like no give us answers like screaming at someone who was already admitted that they were in some sort of drug-induced stupor isn't gonna get you answers like are you guys even okay with this <laughs> like that is true i think at I think that part moment, of it is like, the fact right, that I'm like you guys you're a problem because you want to get your brother back but you're not doing the math to realize you need to kill at least three more people. It's like, that means you suck too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think part of it is with her is that a lot of people realize that her pricked on, on the lament configuration, the box, the way she did, uh, did something to her, like it intoxicated her. And maybe that intoxication drove a lot of the decisions she made in the movie. Maybe? I don't know. I, I'm just like, your motivations are awful, because now you gotta kill three people to get your brother back. Your friends are kind of dicks, because one of them straight up betrays you, and the other one keeps yelling to, keep, to get answers, and just kind of doing very little. Where I'm like, all of you kind of suck. Like, yeah. why am I rooting for any of you to live? Yeah. But I will say when it comes to her, though, like, she does learn from her mistakes. She's still not a great character, but the development she does go through makes her serviceable enough as a lead as to follow. Like, even though she does try to go find all the Cenobites to get her wish, mm -hmm. after seeing what they've done and how they cause pleasure she does realize that even when they bribe tried to bribe her with fake version of her brother that's the best i could put into words there's probably i know there's a better way i could word that but we're fucking live so <laughs> um okay yeah. we'll do it live yeah we're doing <laughs> but essentially um she doesn't accept it because she realizes if she falls into that it's not going to be an award it's eventually just going to cause more trouble mm -hmm. and in something about her situation that I also found really interesting is the Cenobites also try to make her choose between herself and her friends, which also does make things kind of difficult because on one hand, she doesn't want her friends to be killed off, but on the other hand, if she don't do that, they're going to take her. So blood's getting drawn one way or the other, and 
So, yeah, that's something I could say about her. Again, there's not too much you could say, but there is enough to make her a serviceable lead. The mm-hmm. cast, uh, the, like, her friends, again, nothing special, but they do their part. They move the story along, and you can tell they do care about her. So, yeah, that's something I could say about the characters. Nothing great, but serviceable. But there's this one dude that shows up at the end who's basically this movie's version of Frank and the original Hellraiser. Um, yeah, yeah I, did I, a good job. Be, I actually huh? find him to be a common. I find him to be a combination of Frank and Doctor Chenard from the third, the second movie. Oh, okay, that's fair. That's fair. But the thing about him, while the actor I think does a really good job, like I especially like how he delivered the how he delivered the line, how the Cenobites doesn't um give you pleasure; they just um deliver pain. That was nice. It tell it helped move her character. And in my opinion, I thought he, the actor put the right amount of emotion in that line. But at the same time, like, I don't know if his character was established at the beginning of the movie. Because for the first few minutes, I was getting coffee Wait, while my brother's... Dude? Huh? The rich dude? Yeah. Vought. Was he at yeah, the beginning? He was like the first... He was in one of the first scenes of the movie. Yeah. Yeah, I missed that, yeah, I missed that scene because I was getting a coffee. Yeah, but He was in the first scene of the movie. But the it thing is... about him is... you don't. Your really coffee addiction him. cost you, you dumbass. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing about him is you still don't really see him much outside of the first scene and the end because compare him to Frank in the first Hellraiser. Um, you saw him at the beginning, and then when he came, it wasn't around the end. You saw him through a while. He was a cu- hot, he was he a came. consistent Huh? I said hot, he came. Yeah, but when he <laughs> Okay, I see what you did there, but Frank, when he showed up he was there for a while throughout the movie, so he was an actual problem. He didn't just show up again at the last minute. While here, he's established at the beginning of the film, and then he shows up out of nowhere again, and it just kind of seems tacked in. Like, again, he serves his purpose in the story, but how am I supposed to really find interest in this guy as a villain if we really don't really if we really don't know much about him other than he made a deal with the Cenobites and got fucked over? That's the thing. While comparing him to Frank, Frank in the first movie was an actual was a massive issue throughout. He was he was still a twist, but he did not just show up at the end and start causing issues. Yeah, I guess I can agree with that. When it came to this movie, I was actually a bit surprised because when they said this, oh, this is totally a reboot, not a remake. I was thinking, okay, yeah, this is definitely a remake. But then I see the movie and I'm like, oh. So that's why you say it's a reboot, not a remake. That's why you say it could fit in with the other movies. Because except for a few surface level things, it really is its own story. Like the first Hellraiser movie is basically the book come to screw come to screen, with a few minor exceptions. So I was sort of expecting the same thing here. But this this movie is as much a remake of the first Hellraiser. As the Friday the 13th remake is a remake of the original Friday the 13th. It's its own story, basically. And with a few rewrites, it could be its own, could just be another sequel, basically. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly. Not I'm done with this movie. <laughs> yeah, so shall we move to our next movie, gentlemen? Not yet. There is more things I do want to talk about. Um, in terms so much of, better things. In terms of the kills, um, uh. like most of the kills are bad, but I will say I do like how there it goes even further with how the hellish world of the Cenobites is able to just just do about basically anything. Like when that one girl's dying in the vehicle, um, and she starts seeing um the wall start moving forward. That was pretty unsettling to say the least, and. Overall, while the kill itself wasn't anything special, that was some really nice uh, visuals there. And overall, mm-hmm. I like how the box is handled. But the twist I was talking about earlier, the t- killing the Cenobites working as a part of it. Like, when Shatter is just showing up... Uh, and trying, Yeah. Yeah, when Shatter shows up and Daddy. then... <laughs> but what made that scene so good is he just starts backing away from the fence and then... He gets ripped apart. Like, that was a surprise because that means that the Cenobites were just as capable of being fucked with as the human beings. And I don't think any of us expected that. No. I actually did. 
I wrote that down. Well, uh, right next to goal equals save brother with a star. Kill three more people to get brother back. Underlined four times with question marks. I had tried to figure out how the hell is she going to figure this out? One of which is no way she kills the Cenobites. Or you, stat, or you find a way to kill them or use the puzzle box against them. Two, exchange your life for theirs. Three, self-sacrifice. Four, everyone dies. Five, break the puzzle box. Or six, somehow escape. Man, that's like that's the craziest game of Monopoly I've ever heard. I was <laughs> trying to figure out how, like, how is this going to go? Because there's no way this is going to make sense otherwise. I'm like, ah, so they are susceptible to this. That makes no. sense. And I guess they liked it. I guess, like, it won't hurt them because they like it. So why wouldn't they yeah. want to do that then? I also hmm. like the suspense of this movie as uh, before the Cenobites actually show up and start causing real damage. Like, remember when I brought up that there was a mix of the more subtle and supernatural elements from the first two movies with the slasher elements of three sprinkled around? I like I the remember. Movie. Huh? I remember. Yeah, um, something that I did enjoy is when they first show up, it's only in subtle visions to really build up suspense on what these things are before they actually start causing the real trouble. And as a whole, it's just much more impactful anyway because we get to see them, we get to be freaked out by them before seeing what they're capable of. And when we do, it pays off. It's a nice build up. Yeah, it's a very good payoff, actually. I'd definitely say the execution was done really well. Exactly. I'll say something. I I like the setup to the kills throughout the whole movie. Like, I like the whole. At first, you think everything is just fine, and then all of a sudden, the walls start moving and it turns into this hellish landscape. And then you see the Cenobites come out. That's a good setup, almost masterful, if you ask me. But then again, so, some of the kills are sort of lacking in that some of them take place off camera, and then you have one girl in the van. She's the girl I referred to earlier as the one who's literally just there to die. Because throughout the movie, she does nothing. Absolutely nothing. Stupid. <laughs> You're so stupid. Oh, the Weird Al movie. UHF. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, when, when I saw her, I'm just like, You're aren't you? Oh, you're also pretty too, but you're still going to die. I, I did like her death, though, how she was ripped to apart the way she was, even though that's basically what happened to Chatter Chatterer, and that's why Chatterer. people say they are the same as, are basically the same in the movie. I also liked Vought being basically turned into a Cenobite himself at the end. Uh, visually, it was unsettling, but also fascinating. Yeah, exactly. As a whole, I think outside of the kills themselves, the horror aspect was just very well done in the movie in terms of suspense and build-up. And the body Indeed. horror aspect on, on how disgusting everything looked was still Hellraiser and very well done. It's not for everyone, but I, I enjoyed that. Yeah, for, sh for sure. Anyways, is there anything more anybody has to say about this movie? I'm checked out. Wait, I have one more thing to say. Okay. She said the line. The hell priest. She said the line. We have such sights to show you. I was instantly oh, like, yeah, ah, she, ah, she said it. She, she said the line. It, she delivered that so well. Well, it doesn't touch to how Doug Bradley delivered it. Like Doug Bradley had a certain chill to how he said, we have such sights to show you. Like that was just it's creepy as fuck. But the way she did it, you could definitely tell there was love from Doug put into her performance. I think even Doug Bradley said she was really good. Right on. Yeah, she definitely had like a lot of, uh, uh, I guess like some of the chemistry that he did when he when she said that. But yeah, later on it kind of didn't have it. What yeah, she said, right on. Though, was that's fair. But anyway, let's move on to Werewolf by Night. I'm gonna be looking at my notes to find to find where I start. So who wants to go first? Um, I guess I will. All right, gotta go um, for it. I'll fact check you guys on comic lore. Okay, so even though I know next to nothing about the Werewolf by Night comics, I've always been fascinated with the concept of the character ever since I learned about him. I'm just like, ooh, a werewolf in the Marvel Universe, you say. Tell me That's more. Cool. So when I was go when I went to go watch this uh, Disney Plus special, I honestly had no idea to what to expect. 
I wanted to be entertained, but at the same time, I was on my guard because I didn't know if they were going to throw in some sort of cringy wokeness, at, like well, apparently they did with She Hulk. I don't know because I haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, She Hulk. So, <laughs> she Hulk is a character of her own. She's been around forever. That's not woke. No, I'm, I'm not, not talking about. I'm talking about the way she was used was woke, but go on. Yeah, yeah not she hawked the, herself. The way she was used. Yeah, the way she was yes. used was woke. That's what I, that's what I meant. I, my apologies. Yes. I should have clarified. Yeah, I like the stronger. character of she... I like the character of she Hulk. Uh, I saw know about her mostly from the 90s animated Hulk show, and I thought she was awesome in that, and Kree Summers is a awesome performance as her in that show, but that's not what we're, what we're talking about. Anyways, I was on the first guard for the first half of the special because I was like, is there going to be any cringe here? Is there going to be any cringe? But over time, I'm just like, lulled into a sense where I'm like, I'm having fun. I'm enjoying this because, well, it does a lot of callbacks to classic black and white horror from the 30s and mm -hmm. 40s, especially regarding the Universal Monsters. And But it also has its own sort of special Marvel spin that makes it feel fresh while also classic at the same time, if that makes any sense. And it makes perfect when, sense. And when it yeah, came it time for sense. the... Thank you. Thank you all very much. And when it came time for the actual werewolf by night to come on screen, I'm just like, oh, yeah. And it was another fine example of the whole a uh, modern interpretation of a classic character because it felt to me like it felt like it was touching and respecting the classic werewolf depiction and the Wolfman in the same way, well, the 2010 Wolfman remake was. It was a lot of love, but at the same time felt fresh. And also, uh, there's a special character that showed up in this uh, special that I was not expecting, but when I saw him, I was really happy to see him. I was just sort of fan squeeing about it. And overall, I'd say this is fun. That's all I got to say about it is it was fun. Hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. The movie, before we get into the spoiler aspects, there was definitely a nice little love. It was basically a love letter with a box of chocolates to fans of the old Universal Monster movies. Like, this is the most different the MCU has been. And I cannot stretch that enough. Like, Shang-Chi had its own difference to it as it felt a lot like a Chinese, Japanese, etc. monster martial arts movie. But this Chinese, right Japanese, here, dirty knees, look at these. <laughs> okay, I should just say East Asian martial arts movie. You happy? <laughs> but I'm never happy. But basically, when it comes to this, is this takes it even further? As I don't even know if this qualifies as a superhero movie. Like by th that way, is does Underworld and all that count as superhero? Since really, it's no. just a yeah. Like basically, it's just a werewolf that fights monsters that's basically what it is at least i in this would particular. consider it like almost a dark fantasy movie kind of you know what yeah. i mean yeah, yeah. That's what they considered like movie. underworld to be was like a horror dark fantasy movie i'd argue that underworld was more of action dark fantasy with horror elements as to me if it's to me horror is real horror is when something is trying to get some type of horrific aspect out of you, rather it be disturbing you or scaring you or things like that. But mm. this, yeah, it would fall similar to that. And as a whole, it did, there was definitely a lot of love here. Like the music, there was some Marvel tracks sprinkled around that came out later, but you got to keep the tone. You got to remind the audience that what you're watching is Marvel to some extent. So on the more, the more upbeat moments, it was a night of breath of fresh air. But I really like the atmospheric score in this movie as it's dripping with it. From the start, you get the Universal style logo and things like that with very much old movie like music playing, which old movie music is not for everyone. But whether or not you like that music on a personal mm. level for what this movie is going for, it worked perfectly and i cannot stretch that enough on how the film felt it was just an overall nice atmosphere that really complemented the mood and and is when it comes to everything like the effects the werewolf suit well the i much prefer the more dog-like appearance and things like dog soldiers this is a drawback to the old universal stuff so it was cool to see something that was more 
like the original Wolfman. And it was pretty nice to say the least. And there are a few j- false jump scares thrown in that though that I did not like. Like I know you're trying you're making a horror movie, but don't choose one of the problems that goes for other horror movies here to make it qualify as such. <laughs> yeah, like like the uh, like every like a soundtrack ever from like 2008 to up to now like some horror movie always does it like the exactly it's I, I hate that yeah, it's i annoying. hate that so much yeah it's annoying in other movies and it's not any better here like i get this as being different from other marvel movies but don't take notes yeah. from things yeah. other horror movies even, do wrong even even godzilla did it like remember 2014 when godzilla yeah. first showed up they do like the uh yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, Hey, like, it was stop. awesome when he did that. You, you, <laughs> no, you. no, it wasn't because they pulled away from right when it was yeah. when he did it. It's like okay, you did that, the problem with that scene is the fact that we, they right. cut us off from what we wanted look, to look, see. Look, 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 they're on TV and the audience just like, what the fuck? That's what? not a jump scare. That's a jump. Yeah, cut. people in the movie are actually getting to see the battle while we are cock teased. That's right. fucking I, I, okay, I, I had a joke when the stop movie came sense. out. All right, well, I, I just want to tell you this real quick before we get back on topic. I had a joke when that movie came out. It, w- it was this. So Godzilla goes to the bathroom during the set, and then he comes back on stage, and he goes, all right, Mr. Edwards, I'm ready for my close-up. And Garrett Edwards turns around and goes, you were gone? Because, <laughs> you know, it's like he shot it. Godzilla. It's like he shot it, but, like, Godzilla wasn't there. It's like... <laughs> But that's the but yeah, um, I do like the atmosphere in it. When it comes to the scares, I get it's going for a more universal and atmospheric approach, and it did very well. But I will say it, uh, th- I there is something about the tone that isn't always perfect. Like there's still some of that MCU forced comedy sprinkled around that, while didn't make yeah. me cringe like some jokes, like in No Way Home when they saw Ock and just laughed at his name. Like seriously, what's the fucking joke there? But. Yeah. Yeah, but when it showed up here, while it wasn't great or good or anything, I st- while it wasn't terrible, I still took issue with it as it kind of took away from the experience. And I'm all for mixing the modern Marvel tone with old school horror movies. That's fine. Remind the audience what they're watching. Like, I, pr- I was praising that about the musical aspect and points, but... When you're just forcing in humor to get off a checklist, I said this before, but that's a problem. And... Also, another thing is, I feel like this movie should have been the length of the Universal Monster movies, like one hour and ten minutes. It's not far off, and for the most part, the movie, at a digestible length, moves the plot itself smoothly, it doesn't feel overly short, and everything about it seems just right. But the characters tend to suffer a bit, and I'll go more into that, but they do suffer from the lack of time they're given for you to actually find interest in them. Black said we'll get into more of that on a spoiler section. But as a whole, very good action horror movie. I really enjoyed it. Definitely one of the more interesting things to come out in the MCU in a long, long while. And I am hoping they do um, the Legion of Monsters down the road, which is basically the horror version of the Avengers, which would be cool. Like, this movie, Marvel in general, tends to primarily be for kids. Like, there's a difference between primarily and just. A lot of nerd stuff is primarily for kids and that's okay a lot of stuff i like is primarily for a younger audience but who cares but here's the thing about this movie Uh, is um hmm? no and i was wondering keep going okay i'm just going sidetracked with it (laughs) but it is nice that this movie right here goes back to the more and goes for a more adult aspect as a it goes it's a treat for the adult fans of marvel because they know that marvel is still very popular with an adult community and stuff like this serves as a treat to us so i would like to have more of this like give us ghost rider give us blade give us the fucking legion of monsters come on we're getting blade huh we're already getting blade Oh yeah. Well, we oh, might yeah, be. Agree. From what I understand, the movie's uh, production is very troubled right now. Well, we'll see yeah. how that goes. So. Yeah. Kanye West is Blade. <laughs> but as a whole, yeah, oh, I God, really no. like this movie. It was a very solid attempt to, as a treat. It was a very solid treat for the adult fans of Marvel, in my opinion. You keep definitely saying that. <laughs> but it's. Uh, definitely more of a more obscure character since i'm pretty sure a lot of people do not know who the fucking werewolf 
from of Marvel is, but well, it should. I yeah, didn't know I watched it. <laughs> but this should spread his name out a bit more, and I say that in a good way. I mean, I, it probably won't. Let's be honest. There's several werewolves in the Marvel universe, and I think like Captain America Wolf is still more popular than Werewolf by Night. Yeah. All I will say really? about this mm -hmm. is every start has a beginning. Well, well, at least it wasn't another Morbius, you know. Yeah. <laughs> at least, Cooper, what do you think? We it's Morbid time. Up. What? What do I think? Yeah, you haven't said yet. Oh, okay. I was waiting for you guys to finish up. I thought it was good. I I really liked it. I liked what they were doing with the uh, the story, and I liked that the werewolf was like like the classic like older werewolves. Like, like it was it wasn't like the new wave stuff we've been seeing, you know, ever since Dog Soldiers and stuff. Although, like to be fair, if I had to choose which one I liked better, it's like some mix in between of like Jack Nicholson's Wolf and um. The Howling Werewolf, like some mix between those two, if I had to pick one. But, uh, you know, like I, I, I really enjoyed it. And I thought like, you know, this is a good step in the right direction for Marvel. And I think like, you know, this they, they got something that will work, you know, if they continue to do more with it. Yeah, it could bring more variety to the MCU because I'm sure everyone can agree that MCU does have um, a lot of patterns, and that's okay. It's a franchise, but with something like Marvel, you're adapting Marvel content. Marvel's a company, not a fucking franchise. So, I mean, it is. Well, not just a franchise, but it's a company as well, so there's a lot of variety you could get from adapting the source material. So it would be nice if we get more stuff like this brought to film rather than just what everyone's already used to. Mm, yeah that's the uh, I'm, uh, uh just words so that's the thing i want to believe that and this is as you guys said it's a definite starting point to definitely diving into more of the lesser known characters because i don't need a full movie about werewolf by night i don't care about werewolf by night hell jj jameson's son the astronaut becomes a werewolf at one point I don't give a damn about him. <laughs> I don't need a movie about him. Yeah. But a small little short would be interesting. Marvel did those little shorts before. They did several of them before. They stopped doing them. Now this is just an extended version of it. I would like more. I'll be honest. I would love more of lesser known characters getting like one hour specials just to show this is in the universe somewhere. This is around. This is happening. Doesn't need to tie in anything. Just be like, hey, FYI, vampires. There's a werewolf. There's a badass chick who's now a monster hunter floating around. I'm okay with that. Totally happy with that. We could do a whole Savage Land thing and have Scar, uh, Hulk's son, Scar? Uh, eventually yeah. with that. Or just have someone in the Savage Land just running around it's like, hey, there's a place in Antarctica called the Savage Land. And the plot twist would be, it takes place in modern day. And it's like, how the hell is that a thing? But I would love that. I don't know mm -hmm. if they'll do it. I'm open to the ideas of it. That being said, yeah. I really liked World of My Night. You guys have said all my main points already. Where... Yeah, it feels like the old Universal 50s and 60s monster movies. They had the practical effects of the werewolf, so it looks like this is just a dude with prosthetics and, like, hair glued to his face. Yeah. It was fun going into it. I was happy seeing Elsa. The minute they said Bloodstone, I'm like, Elsa has to be in this, right? Because she's, like, she's like the badass monster hunter of the Marvel Universe, aside from Blade. Blade is cool. I kind of like Elsa a bit more. Just because in the comics, I always heard that, like, Scottish tone to her when she's, like, slaying monsters. She's like, oh, okay. I don't get the Scottish, but I'm like, I like you. I still like you. I would like to see more of her still. Oh, yeah. Excuse me while I play the bagpipes. And yeah! <laughs> they even had the little black dot in the corner of the screen. And I was so happy seeing yeah. that. Like, that's the little detail that shows they cared about the 50s and 60s things. Joey, do you know what that black dot was? The black dot? You mean the cigarette burn? No! You don't know! So, in the old movies, they were done on reels. They're, and in the yes. upper right-hand corner, there'd be a black dot. The person who was operating the projector had to look for that black dot to know when he had to put in the next reel of film. 
The first dot told you to get ready. The second dot told you to switch it over. And they uh, had okay, okay. both of those in there. I'm like, wow. That's... Uh, okay. Because what I noticed was the cigarette burn, which is also an aspect for the, which was also a little thing to pay back to the old movies, since a lot of them also had would have that cigarette burn thing there. Oh, yeah. Like, that's a whole other one. I just like that blacked out where if you watch a lot of the old VHS tapes or something, it's like, what the hell was that? And yeah, usually, yeah. It just goes to the back of your mind. You don't notice it. But if you're looking for it, it's like, oh, there it is. And that's something we don't get in films anymore. So I'm just yeah. happy enough going into it. Like I said, I want more of these one shots. Can I say who it was that popped up, please? Yes. Yay, we got Man-Thing. Out of all the random things to show up in this movie, Man-Thing showed up in a very nice-looking Labyrinth plot set, actually. Yeah. I was so happy. I love Labyrinth-based things. I love monster-hunting-based things. I love when the monsters are trying to save each other. I love when people are saving monsters. And I love we got Man-Thing out of all... Like, I didn't expect to see Ted at all. And I was happy seeing him. They even had the whole, like, they even had the bit of, he, like, anyone who knows fear burns at the man thing's touch. They did that really well. It's like, wow, I didn't think they'd use, like, like that's really cool. Where they were just burning and melting in his hands. I'm like, wow. That's what that was nicely done. I'm happy. Yeah, and I then, like that too because I always found interest in the man thing as a character. I always found his design to be cool and his origins mm -hmm. to be actually very fascinating. And the movie did handle it well. Like he has very much potential to be in a move in more movies. However, when it comes to the MCU, I don't think they're gonna do more with him because he's a very graphic monster. Yeah. So and he might be too much for what they consider kid friendly. Or, or, uh, you know, part of the magical kingdom. Oh, yeah. It's too spooky. <laughs> I mean, man, like, man, like Ted is is the dude who's just trying to like be at peace and trying to exist on his own. He doesn't try and go out through a lot of the adventures. He doesn't go trying to do superheroing. He just exists in his swamp to be like, leave me alone. I'm a monster. I want to try and turn back, but there's no way I can do that properly. So I'm stuck oh, wait, like this. Are we talking about man thing right now? Yo. Yeah. Yes, fucking man thing was in this thing. And his really? name is Ted. I love yeah. him. I love mm -hmm. it. He I mean, look, that is his name. He didn't look as cool as he looked in the thing movie opinion, but his presentation overall. Yes. But his presentation yeah. overall I still thought was better. Like he actually fucking screen time and they mm -hmm. made damn good use of it. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, the effects in the sci-fi movie were surprisingly really fucking good better than a lot of the mcu effects in my opinion but the thing about the effects here i also think the effects here were really good on man thing which is crazy because a lot of the mcu i think this is because the artists the visual effects artists have a lot of abuse issues from disney but a lot of marvel movies these days tend to have um their effects all over the place like there's points where they'll look good there's points they'll look bad and there's points they'll look serviceable mm -hmm. man thing throughout outside of one point where he was running he did look a bit cartoonish but as a whole he looked great in this movie the detail on him especially when he's in color and we're able to see everything about him in full detail he just looks very plant-ish and he's supposed to yeah but that's the that's what i'm saying he looks yeah. very plantish and it looked a lot like something that's been wet. That's something I really did like. Those are some really good effects. And when he was standing with the leading guy, there were really, he I didn't see him as a CGI monster. He looked real and the emotions he made were also very convincing. And the kills from him were better than the fucking Hellraiser movie. Every Leo. Yeah. He had like two yeah. kills in that whole in, he had two kills in a lip in like what maybe 10 maybe yeah like less than 10 minutes of screen time and the two kills he got i'm like wow that like i remembered that yeah but you're not gonna also get can that we long... also can we talk about how just freaking awesome his bromance is with jack yeah, yeah. like there's like i one thing i'd like is in this movie 
it is though it's overall more horror-esque there is some cutesy bromance real moments is between him and man thing especially mm. around the end it's you don't get too much of it but the moments are actually very heartwarming and bring a more sweet aspects to a darker movie and i mm. really did enjoy that another thing where you could kind of get to remember the fact that it's a marvel film but it's a good reminder unlike the forced comedy at points yeah, that's the thing, like, Man-Thing isn't a monster. He's a human that got turned into basically Swamp Thing. Yeah. So I'm like, that, like that's good. They kept it, it's like, this, like, when you first look at it, they're like, this is a monster. And the world was like, no, his name is Ted. He, like, <laughs> his name like, is he Ted. has a name. <laughs> he has a personality. And you know what? Seeing his little facial expressions was oddly kind of cute. Just because he can't you know very much. But seeing his eyes going from angry to surprise, it's like, where do you go? It's like, oh, he went that way. It's like, <laughs> it's like right, you know what they should do? <laughs> if they ever do make a, a man thing movie for the MCU, they should call it Ted. Oh, unlikely, but that would be nice. And have Seth MacFarlane guest star and say, you're creepy. That's adorable. <laughs> that is <laughs> unlikely to happen, but you know unlikely. what? That would be Come fun. On. To watch, yeah. just it, it'd be nice to see him just pop in and out of other supernatural things, right? I, I don't know. There is a recent in the recent Avengers comic that's been going out for a couple years. A part of Man Thing split off, and he's hanging out with Blade, and it's going known as Boy Thing or Kid Thing or something like that. So, I don't like that name. Whatever, Kid Thing is hanging out with Blade, and it still has the abilities of Man Thing. It just it it's also just like leached onto Blade as it's running around. I'm like, that's an odd combination, but okay. <laughs> so yeah, like, you know what? That might be a thing somewhere. But it's all made an opportunity to explore fun scenarios. Like, yeah. look at the wacky adventures of Blade and Kid Thing. I don't like that yeah. name either. That, that was like, you know what? Let's do another adventure of Elsa doing something else with the monster hunting. Let her see. Let's see her have a run in with Blade accidentally somewhere. We can get something because we know Dracula is in the world. I think that's probably going to be in Blade, but Dracula is in the world. We can just do something with him in the sidelines. We can do something with Fing Fan Foom in the sidelines. Give me Beta Ray Bill. Give me like a one shot, one hour of Beta Ray Bill. That's all I want. That's all I, what I ever want. Yeah. And in terms of the characters, though, something I do want to say is the leading actor, I feel like he took a lot of inspiration from Lon Chaney as the Wolfman in the original movie. Like, the way he portrayed his emotions mm -hmm. with the facial expressions and line delivery gave off a lot of that vibe, which was a pretty cool aspect, considering that in many ways, if you just shown this movie to someone who doesn't know of its existence they might just think it's a remastered blu-ray of an old most people aren't gonna know what man thing is let's, let's be honest here most people aren't <laughs> gonna know what most of this is yeah that's why if they just see it they'll they probably think it's an actual movie in the universal the monster films mm -hmm. and they might even mistake that guy for lon chaney jr if they haven't watched a movie with lon chaney in a while mm -hmm. and yeah i thought he was really good in the film mm -hmm. but something i but something I do want to say, though, is, uh, like I said before, the characters tend to suffer from the short runtime the most. The plot itself, the plot itself moves very good. Mm -hmm. It feels like a move. It feels like an old movie, like a movie, a part of the Universal Monster movies. The plot elements generally come in at the right time. They get points to develop. The twist of the man thing showing up was appropriately timed. But something I do want to say is that if they would have just made it like about the length of a Universal Monster movie, which isn't much longer, like an hour and ten minutes, our leading characters could have been better. Like, nobody's going to remember this fucking villain. Um, the leading characters, for example, she's with our leading guy for a bit. They get time to work together. But just a little bit after, when she finds out that he's a fucking werewolf, um... There's this big dramatic moment on how he kept that hidden from her, but how are we supposed to get this big emotional effect like it seemed to have been aiming for if these two barely have interacted with each other? Well, right, there's we were, no chemistry we're... going on between them. Yeah, that's right. something that really did bother me. Like I said, the mm -hmm. characters, if they would have just made it as long as the Universal Monster movie, you would have had a full package in the runtime. Because the plot itself, all of that is done well. But mm -hmm. the characters, 
they could have been better, even if the actors all do very good jobs. Also, I, f- I know this is kind of irrelevant, but I feel like if Johnny Depp was in this movie, like, this is irrelevant, and so this movie doesn't take yeah. place in the old days, but if Johnny Depp was in this movie, I feel like he would have brought back that old way that people talked back then. I'm not saying that's necessary here, since it takes place yeah. in modern You're day. talking about the transatlantic accent, yeah. Yeah, mm. that's something that John, Johnny Depp did in movies like Sleepy Hollow and From Hell, and that's and that would have been a nice touch, but I can't really criticize this movie for that, since even though it's trying to capture that old feel... At the same time, it doesn't take place in the old days. Yeah, so. it takes place modern day. It just looks like it's from the old times. Yeah, that's what you can't. It's all the it, better but... for it. Yeah, yeah. but I, I wouldn't I be like it. Like but they I kept that mad. style for a reason. It's like that's that's fun. Yeah, but that's the thing about the characters, in my opinion, is nobody's gonna remember the villain, and there was no chemistry between him and the girl before the big reveal on who he was. Though on his reveal, I will say I like how the transformation was done. Felt retro as well mm-hmm. like we don't see the transformation itself but it goes and shows the, 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 the transformation through oh. shadows yeah and that yeah, really like shadow. some people would be like oh it doesn't show us the transformation but it really brings when you think about what they're going for is to bring no no, no, no time, time, time. you're not giving that scene due credit going into it apologies but the transformation was well done and you're not giving that enough credit because yes you see it from like you are looking at Elsa, backed up against the cage, horrified, seeing someone she was kind of helping along and assisting, you can hear the bones snapping. You can hear him screaming and like his skin and shirts tearing while the shadow, while like lightning's going in the background, and you see his body morphing into the wolf man. It's like, oh, you hear and see the contorting. It hits all the senses going in, where it's like, I don't need to see what's going on to know exactly how scary this is. Oh yeah, that's oh yeah, that's what I was saying. Is mm-hmm. it does. Uh, it shows you enough f- from the sound and the visuals of the shadow, but while also leaving some room for interpretive f- to your imagination, a lot like yeah. those old movies did. And that's what made that transformation so effective. Mm. It's not the American world in London transformation, but it's not supposed to be. Yeah. It's supposed to be more like the Wolfman transformation. And you uh, know what? It worked. Yeah. I, I, I will always be a big fan of the Van Helsing werewolf. I know you guys keep bringing up ghost dog soldiers, and that is an excellent version of those werewolves. Van Helsing werewolf is where I will always throw my hat into that ring. <laughs> Same. But, but I'll be honest. Like, Van- I, hmm? uh, yeah. I was, I'm sorry. Let, finish your thing, then I'll do my thing. All right. But yeah, when I saw, like, when I was seeing the transformation, I'm like, oh, cool. What version is going to look like? And then I saw he was the practical effects style wolfman. Like, I laughed more than anything where it's like oh that's an amazing touch going it's like wow they really felt made this old detail because they could have made him a cgi werewolf they didn't and i'm happy yeah. about that even yeah, the I'm fire happy. effects they, like, like even the effects they did with him leaping and attacking like this feels like an old movie with them just having wires just on them somewhere. I would have been all the happier if you could see it somewhere. I might want to rewatch it to see if they have like a wire showing just because you could do that in some of the old movies. Where it's like, hey, I see where the wire is. I saw it all the time in like Godzilla movies with Rodan flying or Ghidorah flying. No, I even saw like, the new ones like with Megagirus. <laughs> yeah. Where it's like, I want. To see if there's a wire in there. If so, I'll have to give this movie more credit. Yep. You know, you brought up Van Helsing. I don't know if this was discussed because, well, I had to walk away for a little bit. Did it seem to you guys like this movie was sort of like the opening prologue of Van Helsing, but ex- extended? But yeah, I, uh, I can see that. A little bit, yeah. And I mean that in the best way. Yes. So again, they had practical effects for it looks like everything for the most part. They had like they had sets built. It looks like a labyrinth was built that they were running around in because they had pieces set up for them to do that fighting and whatnot. I'm like, that's cool. And I like those practical effects more. It feels like a more real lived in world where most of the time when I watch movies now, it's like I can tell the background is just CG or where they're standing is just CG. I'm like, no, I want to see sets i want to see them lurking around corners i want to see the shadows around corners that are actually there right on 
Yeah. 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 No more green screening. <laughs> Yeah, like I, by all means, I'm open to a mix of it. Like, man, thing obviously is going to be generated, but that's fair. That still looks good in the believable of everything else. But yeah, I fully say this movie gets like a B, B plus. I would probably like, rewatch it again. It's like, you know what? I'm up for just a silly how. Ho- like, this feels like just a fun Halloween movie to just put on, or if I'm in a mood to watch some sort of like simple little monster movie this hits that little niche it doesn't have to take up all day i don't have to pay attention all the time i was like this seems like some fun just thrown to the background fair i give it a seven really good but there were a few flaws that i already pointed out that should have been fixed but as a whole definitely one of the more interesting products of the mcu to come out lately (laughs) and the digestible timing definitely gives it a extra appeal to revisit but yeah, seven out of ten. Good movie. Would highly recommend it if you're a fan of, if you're a fan of classic horror or even just like Marvel for that uh, for that matter. Mm-hmm. What about you, Hooper? What's your rating? Uh, eight out of ten, like a seven, eight out of ten. I, I, seven point five. Let's do a seven point five. Fair enough. And Cody. <clears throat> well, before I give my rating, I want to give what are some personal highlights of the. Special for me. Okay. First of all, the majority of it being in black and white, nice touch. Mm-hmm. I, except for the when they showed the bloodstone when it was glowing red. I'm seeing it contrasted against everything being black and white. I'm just like, nice. Mm-hmm. And the practical effects again, I enjoyed that too. Man thing, you already heard me geek out earlier. You know that I enjoyed having Ted in there. Mm-hmm. Fucking Ted. Mm-hmm. And uh, and also, um, the I also enjoyed the werewolf transformation and the practical effects on him. And actually, seeing uh, will the werewolf by night get to kick some major ass? That was fun. But something mm-hmm. that made me just smile because I thought it was so cute was when they played Judy Garland singing "Somewhere Over the Rainbow," and then everything started to turn to color. I'm just like, I that see what cute. you did there. That was cute. Mm-hmm. That was a very cute detail. I'll give you that. Yeah. I forgot yeah. that. <laughs> For anyone who doesn't know, The Wizard of Oz is one of my favorite movies of all time. And that's why that particular moment got me. It might actually end up being my favorite moment of the whole thing. For me, I would give this special a 8 out of 10. I don't care. I enjoyed it. It was fun. 8 out of 10 right, for yeah. sure. Sounds reasonable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anyway, let's move on to, give me a minute, Hooper suggested that we add a picture to this. He See, he's smiling. He's excited. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Do, it. Do it. Do it. What, what's going Do on? It. Prepared. Present. Okay, settings. One minute. God, one yeah, minute. I'm scared. What is he looking at? Don't worry, I'll hold your hand. Can I have no hands? <laughs> I have such sights to show you. <laughs> uh, so give me a minute. I think Twitch has a. I think it's called present. Yeah, share screen, share screen. Um. But yeah, I was able to show you my screen before. I was just showing you images. Okay. If we accidentally close this out of the chat, I'm gonna laugh at you. I mean, that would be fun. Okay. So y'all see Whoa. it? Oh. What we're looking oh. at is Shed oh. Ultraman. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I feel confused, or but that's that's good. Yeah, like I like how that's dumb, but I feel confused. Yeah, <laughs> it's so random, but that's a part of the humor. Yeah, it's a uh, it's 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 Pee Wee Herman doing Ultraman instead of him going like like Schwartz. He's going. <laughs> that seems even more terrifying now. Oh, oh that Pee-wee is nightmare Herman. fuel. Just play horror music over it while zooming in on his face. Uh, it's gonna scare the fuck out of anybody. <laughs> no, no, Pete. No. But anyway, uh, uh, on spoiler-free thoughts before spoilers, I love this movie. Um, I like it's uh, definitely much more. Please fast- get this thing away from me. <laughs> it's staring into my soul. <laughs> like I can't look away. I don't want to. <laughs> from a perspective, if you like Shin, what Shin Godzilla did with the original Gojira, yeah. you should really enjoy what Shin Ultraman does with Ultraman because Shin, Ultra, Shin Godzilla, what it did with Godzilla, 
it took the, the premise and things about that movie and reimagined them in a modern day with relevant messages and kind of pushed Godzilla's God thing further. And this basically does something similar with the original Ultraman. That's why the tone of Shin Godzilla is much more slower paced, um, heavier on political stuff, and takes a bit for Godzilla to actually show himself is because that's a reflection of the theme of what that's reimagining. Shin Ultraman, on the other hand, is much faster paced, and I say that in a good way because it's doing that as a way to reimagine the 66 show, and I think it does a really good job at that, considering that you still have those heavy dialogue philosophical moments around the team and instead of trying to under to beat a monster which was in shin godzilla they're trying to understand this heroic alien that keeps coming to save them and what he is and all that is interesting but it's also blended in with some very fun and lighthearted moments and for a while ultraman shows up a lot like every few minutes you would go from the humans and then to the monsters which for a while that was bothering me i was like it needs to slow down but then as it went on it actually did work because around the second half it slowed down in the right way to get to get you more invested in the characters and i'll go in why there was so much action at the beginning in the spoiler section but i'm glad but it needed to be there and it was overall a nice blend because while shin Godzilla is more heavy on dialogue this is more of a balance between action and and a story. And speaking of such, I like how they kind of took elements from those episodes of the original show and took the basics of their plot and blended them in with the main plot of this movie. And that especially makes the twist of what's causing all that, the connecting narrative of these events, all the more impactful in my personal opinion. And as a whole. And speaking of such, I also thought the comedy was funny. It still was more subtle, a lot like Shin Godzilla's, but there's a bigger empathis on it here since it's a reimagining of Ultraman while Shin Godzilla was a reimagining of Gojira. But it was nice to all overall see that. And would it count as a spoiler if I mentioned one of the comedic moments? Like uh, I don't know which one you're talking about. So um, You were talking to me about it in Discord on how you thought it was funny. Um, that was so long ago, dude. <laughs> Just, okay, well, just say it. Yeah, just okay, say it. Anyway, my well. Like on how Ultraman starts, uh, talks in a very alien and non-human-like tone. Now it's oh funny. right, yeah. Like yeah. he brought the co- like when he just came in with his own coffee, and that one was in As- Asami. That was her name, Asami. Mm-hmm. Um, she was very suspicious of him since he basically just kept running off and transforming, and he just overall seemed very odd. He talked different from everybody. He he, he always disappeared, and he was the new guy, so everyone was kind of, and he just seemed overall very mysterious, so she was just looking for reasons to dislike him, so when she was like, you could have asked if yeah, I wanted a coffee too, and he said- Honestly, like, yeah, I'll give you that. He felt like, the Ultraman seemed so unaware of human dialogue and culture that my first instinct would have been- you're a robot, or you're not human. Yeah, because he started yeah. saying that we are self. Uh, I don't think exact word he used, but he was saying something like we are self-serving organisms. Humans are but- self-sufficient organisms. I'm like, if anyone refers to me or any other human as an organism, just to describe ourselves, they are clearly not from this planet. Or, or the one that really cracked me up was like the first one that he says. It's like like before that one, which is where he's in the committee, uh, where, where they're having a little meeting together, and, and he says like, uh, "What do you use to call uh, human interactions with each other?" And they just go, "Buddy, I- I'm your friend." Oh, but he's just like, "Oh," <laughs> but I'm like, yeah. I like how specific he is, and he just kind of has that face where he's just like, "Oh, I didn't know it was that simple." <laughs> yeah, like you are not human dude yeah. yeah and i really enjoyed that and something i will say is as he learns more throughout the movie in an unspoiler relief fashion um it was nice because as he hangs around with people he begins to understand them more and he starts to be to talk like them more which is a nice touch to his character considering that his origin and the stuff he has about him like they even point out in the movie he's a being just like us and again, I'll go dive deeper I into mean, that. I mean, not point. just like us. Let's be honest. Well, not just he, like he us. Like from a, okay, so he comes from a culture that's very much like ours, but alien that's different well, from we us. Think, like, we don't see their culture, really. We just kind of know 
their alien race looks like Ultraman, and they have superpowers apparently and are traveling through the galaxy. That like I don't really get. There's like they're just like us. Like are you? Well, I mean, yeah, aliens yeah, are vastly it, different from ours. Yeah, like I like he does say it like somewhere in there. He says like, oh well, they were like us at one point. Like it's mm-hmm. he's hitting it like some way that there were similar at one point whether or not like you know it is now but it was like a long time ago they were yeah like, so. well, it's like that yeah. just kind of shows like okay so you're far beyond evolved from what we are so i can't say that we're similar because there is a giant disparity between our two cultures now yeah. even if we're even if you're even if we're used to what you used to be that's still a big change <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you know, you know what uh, he should have done when she was suspicious about him, you know, being like an alien and stuff. Or just kind of, where she's kind of giving that look, like I don't know, like you know, all the scenes where she gets excited, like she slaps her butt or she grabs it, like you yeah. know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. she's like, I thought that, was, that was weird. Like, you know, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ultraman should have just looked there, just been like, but why do you keep grabbing your butt? Yes. <laughs> like, why just why would anyone slide? ask that question? <laughs> Like, like I mean, it's a rational question. It's like, well, wh- why are you asking? Like, why are you talking in such a strange way? Well, why do you keep grabbing your butt like that when you get excited? That would be <laughs> I, I, I feel, I'm surprised that joke wasn't made. Where it's like, why do you keep smacking yourself like that? It's like, oh, it gets me pumped up and excited. And then he would have started doing that to going- his teammates to excite them. It's like that's a, <laughs> like, that that's is- a super Sentai level joke. But I would have seen that in this movie, but they didn't do it. Yeah, I think that part of what the punchline they were going for instead was the fact that she just keeps doing it and no one ever calls her out on it. They just act like it's a normal thing. Yeah, I, I don't know why. I don't know why they went for that because I actually think what y'all just said there would have been a lot funnier. But yeah. whatever. That is funny too. But okay. But I do understand. I do understand why Anno did do it though, since uh, Anno's humor tends to be more subtle, as I stated. But yes, I definitely would have loved to have seen that. Yeah. Like, that's just, like, it's a you... simple joke. The pr- like you have the like you have the setup there constantly with someone doing a quirky action which they find normal, an alien trying to understand human language. It's the classic fish out of water story where something strange to one person is normal to another. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just saying I understand why. I'm not surprised they didn't use it, considering his style. Yeah. But yeah, but it uh, it would just uh, it would be unexpected for Ano, and that wouldn't be a bad thing. It's just uh, that doesn't seem to be up Ano's uh, Ano or Higuchi's alley when you look at his his their history of humor when it comes to Evangelion or yeah, fair enough. Godzilla. Yeah. yeah. Can, can, can I talk about my favorite villain in the movie? Yeah, <laughs> oh, we'll go that when we get into the spoiler section, but we might as well give All our right. final thoughts and ratings. I'll give oh, it a yeah. nine out of ten. Like, there's, I would say there's two villains. There's two main villains in this. You movie, just but... said not to go into the villains until later. And you're about to start talking. About okay, well, let's go into the. Oh, let's wow. go into, okay, we'll go into the villains, but it's like wow. Okay, well, I'll go into the villains that's used. We won't say what villains they are until we're in the spoiler section. But I, I'll give it a nine. I would. Oh, Naranga, the kaiju. Yeah. Uh, okay, that's not well, really. A spoiler. Well, no, he's not my favorite villain in the movie. But go on. Uh, okay, okay, the kaiju. Yeah, but first, I'll give we'll give the final thoughts and ratings, and then we'll go on to that. But we might as well talk spoilers on the final thoughts and ratings, since a lot of people already watching this are just coming for the spoilers anyway. So I'll give it a nine, mainly because there's two villains in the movie, Zodob and Mephilus. Both are really good, and they both have their own effect on the plot. Like, for example, when Mephilus made Asami the giant... That, as a drawback to the old episode with Fuji, um, that was the show that Ultraman wasn't the only one with that type of power to do that sort of thing. And they both did a really good job. I think the actors were both aliens brought a lot of charisma to the role. I liked how the aliens actually, t- when they were talking to humans, they tried to capture our way of speaking, like in a very philosophical style tone. I'm not sure if anyone else noticed that. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of them was pretty heavy handed with it. Yeah, and that's something I really did enjoy, and that was Zadab who did that. But I do feel like um, if the movie was going to use both of those aliens, they should have made it a tad longer, or just use one alien oh, and have both and have that one it alien. It was already almost two hours long, though. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I feel like um, 
it would have benefited those characters. More. Like, they're both very good, but I feel like uh, using having both of them in the movie or not making it longer to have them both have a strong use so of the story. so many in the movie, though. Kind of undersells them a bit. There were so they were... many in the movie, though. Yeah, but I still think it should have been longer. I'm referring to those two in specific, the two main yeah. aliens. I was I was okay with Zara being killed off quickly because I felt like he was the weaker link in the two. And and to be fair, I think he was also like the weaker alien in the original series compared to Mephilos or Mephilos, depending depending on which way you put it. Because Zarab was very Zarab was always direct about what he was going to do. Mephilos was always the more interesting one because he was more charismatic. And the other thing too was he would flat out lie to Ultraman <laughs> in the original series. Like you'd say, like, oh, I'm doing this over here, and then it's like, ha, lied. It's over here. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah, I get that. I get that. I just think yeah. both villains would have had a bigger impact if they would have just used one and have them both do that, or if they would have made it longer to get you into both more. But as a result, I, I thought both were overall very good characters and brought a lot to the movie. That's why 9 out of 10 for me currently. Mm -hmm. Hooper, but, go for it. You seem to have like a lot to say. I have a lot to say, yes. Yeah, uh, you're excited. Go for it. Okay, okay, cool. So I wanted to say that it was actually funny. Me and my dad watched it together. My dad grew up with the original Ultraman series when it was shown on TBS, like way back in the 60s. And, uh, you know, he wasn't expecting much because, like, back then when they showed it, it was just like, well, it was the monster of the week. He fight Naranga, Gabora, you know, and them, those kind of things. And just like the episodes they showed over in English were, I guess, not the more interesting ones with like Mephilos and stuff. That's why he didn't recognize them, but he recognized. Naranga and Gabora instantly. He's like, oh yeah, I remember him. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I was I was really uh, w impressed how they did. And I think like Ano finally got his style right. I think now because like don't get me wrong, I love Shin Godzilla. I thought like Shin Godzilla was amazing when it came out. But I think now that I've seen this, he's found a perfect balance between like Joey mentioned dialogue and action with the monsters fighting and stuff. And the other thing too, I'll definitely say is like, I guess like the, not only like the CGI, I think has improved a little bit, but it's just like the, the movement. Like I was not, I was not expecting Naranga or Gabora to be as like fast paced as they were. You know what I mean? Cause the trailer showed them always like kind of slow and stuff. Like I was not expecting Gabora to do these like the crazy three sixty turns and the, the fast drilling where he tucks his arms under his chest and stuff. I wasn't expecting all that. And just like for it to be a, just like the crazy action they ended up doing with it, mm. especially some of the camera shots, like, you know, the, the chase scene, which I'm not going to get into that, but until later, but uh, it was just really well done. And I thought the actors were phenomenal. And honestly, I mean, I don't know if they're going to do it, but I really hope we get like <laughs> some crossover Shin Godzilla. Cause I would love that if it happens, I doubt yeah. it. I doubt it, but he did say, like, there's the whole emblem thing they got, which is called the Japan Shin Shin Japan Heroes thing, which has Kamen Rider Godzilla, and then also this on it. So I just, I kind of can't help but wonder, like, you know, why would that emblem or that universe thing exist if that wasn't the eventual plan? You know Especially what I mean? I think um, a, a, a novel of this, I could be, I could have heard this wrong, but I think the no, a book of this movie, I think they established that there are subtle connections that tie it into to the same universe but right now they didn't want to make anything too obvious from what yeah. i understand one of the actors uh has a small who has a small bit in this movie was actually reprising or the exact same role he had from shin godzilla yes so he, he does he does have the same role from shin godzilla yes because if you look on the cast thing for like the character he plays it's the exact same name but there's no mention of godzilla which is you know like so well, where did he go you know what i mean yeah it's a subtle tie in where did he go yeah where did he go george which way did he go yeah, yeah. Like, if you want my opinion, I think Shin Kamen Rider is going to go a little further right here. They're just dropping breadcrumbs on what all this could mean. And But I feel like the next movie... Because right now, you got to remember, the Shin Japan universe was just announced when this movie... Before this movie came into theaters. So right now, it's all going to be tiny little things before they could really go on to the big stuff. That's what I think is going on. 
So. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if this becomes the Toho cinematic universe that we all got rumored about because they never specifically said like, oh, we want to do an individual like Mothra movie or something like that. They just said we want to do a cinematic universe like what Marvel was doing. But they never specifically said we just want to do that for Godzilla. They said Toho. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is this is it. Especially when you look at that Shin Ultraman as a Toho movie and how th- other companies like Avon Gillian's company had part in the creation of Shin Kamen Rider. It seems like they're, all these companies are all in on every movie being made to some extent. Yeah. I'm so surprised that's happening. But okay. Yeah, but if I had to rate it, I'd give it like a like nine out of ten. I mean, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Right I give it. Only reason, only reason I don't give it a ten, and this is me being fair. Like this might be my favorite movie of the year, um, is because I yeah, would have liked it um, more. I liked it to be a tad longer to get more time with Zadab and Mephilus, or cut one out and make one of those Sajens do all of the actions. But mm. as a result. Uh, so as a result, both villains are kind of undersold as they just both as they both do few things, but still really good. But yeah, the effects of the movie absolutely incredible. It's very fast paced. The detail and everything is great. And Ultraman, the way he's proportioned and everything, and how shiny he is, he looks very extraterrestrial. And I think that was the point. That was how they reimagined Ultraman here, was going further in his alien-esque appearance. Wasn't he always an alien? He was, yes, but they wanted to go further in how he, in making him look otherworldly, since you can do more with CGI. And I really did like... Before you give your opinion again, Cody, go with yours, because you've been quiet. (laughs) Yeah. Go ahead, Cody. Oh. Oh. What did I think? Yeah. Yeah. I found the movie to be engaging with sufficient characters and equally sufficient special effects that did what was needed to tell the story Anno wanted to tell. What was most compelling about the movie was its blending of Anno's usual themes with an intellectual property that, while he doesn't own it, he clearly has a lot of love for it. Explored are the themes of ethics, authority, morality, responsibility, consequence, and humble men of the human race in the facing the truth that, in the grand scheme of the universe... We don't really matter that much. Any importance placed on the human race is self-inserted, despite the fact that if we were all to one day just disappear, just all be gone, the universe would go on and continue to be. Despite this, Anno also makes it clear in the movie that he believes that we uh, we humans, as intelligent, living, sa- sapient beings, still have a right to live as such. Attic commentary is the meddling of forces beyond our understanding because our natural hubris as human beings and the continued exploration of the perceived incompetence of the Japanese government's response to national and international emergencies uh, and the structure of such. Although it's not nearly as explored as deep as it was in Anno and Higuchi's previous movie, Shin Godzilla. Despite Anno interjecting his usual exploration of these themes, the movie still still felt very respectful to the source material it came from. Uh-huh. This is even though Anno added his all his own twists on the Ultraman mythos, some of which were for the sake of modernization, others to ground the plot as close to the real world as possible to show how we, and particularly the Japanese government, might deal with elements found in the Ultra series if they were to happen in real life. And then there's things that were that were just changed because it's Anno being Anno. The changes are both respectful to the original source material and even fascinating at times. Plus, giant man still go bam bam against giant monsters and giant aliens. <laughs> so the, that alone makes the movie worth it. Overall, I'd call this a pretty damn good movie. Yeah. It's so insightful. I love it. <laughs> what do you give it? Nine out of ten. Easily the best movie we've talked about thus far and probably the best movie I've seen of the year so far. And that's saying something because I actually enjoyed a lot of the movies we've seen so far. Yeah. Well, I, well, I've seen so far this year. Mm. I, I thought it was awesome. Me too, me too. Because that one thing I mentioned wasn't even a negative towards the movie. It was just an aspect that had potential to be more. So I don't have any outside of nitpicks because everything's got I do, nitpicks. Okay. I do but, have and- some a critique that doesn't bother me personally, but mm-hmm. I can see it bothering... Uh, casual viewers, the mm-hmm. movie does partially feel like a bunch of episodes from a TV show crammed yes! together and condensed. Oh my into, god! That 
That was my biggest thing about this whole thing. I was watching it like it feels like I'm watching a television show crammed into one movie. I'm like, why does this feel so long? It's like, okay, cool. This one, like, oh, cool. It's gonna be Ultraman versus a bunch of monsters. Like, all right. So then there's this guy. I'm like, all right, cool. The movie's coming to an end. Nope. There's this other thing happening. Like, all right, fine. It's like, all right, we'll go through that. I'm like, all right, cool. Now the movie's over. Nope. One more showing up. Like, oh, good. Raw. How many yeah. are there with it? Yeah, yeah no, it was, it was like this, like, like, go, Ultraman's not done yet! <laughs> you know, like that, I'll like, give you, that is my biggest criticism, where it's like, this feels like I'm watching a full season of Ultraman in almost a two-hour movie. That's It doesn't bother me personally, but I can see why it would bother other people. It was, was noticeable, having- so I felt it needed to be addressed. I can I did, see I what you expect that. I, I, I like that caught me off guard. <laughs> I can see what you guys mean on that perspective, but I personally don't agree with it. Like, cause on the way, as I feel like they took those aspects from actual Ultraman episodes and blended them in with the actual plot. Because yeah, for a while in the movie, it's if monster shows up some dialogue, monster shows up some dialogue, but that's because in that aspect or later in the movie it's revealed that a lot of it all connects to the one problem and okay, when that so time out in that thought you know that stuff because you know ultraman as someone who doesn't know ultraman that still caught me off guard still it's like this feels really long a lot of people who i know who aren't interested in godzilla still saw shin godzilla because i was able to prove them like it's still a solid movie with godzilla in it this is one of those things. I'm like, this is an Ultraman show in a movie. It's still well done. I have wonderful things to say about it still. I'm just saying on this critique, I'll have to tell people, I'm like, this isn't really more of a movie, more of a show condensed into it, where you get the feel of the show. It's like, all right, yeah, the first few episodes is always going to be Ultraman versus a bunch of monsters. You get the show, you get to show off how formidable Ultraman is against a series of fun monsters. Then usually in the later part of a season, you start learning that there's a bad guy floating in and he's a henchman for a bigger bad guy, which is a henchman or either a bigger bad guy floating in that'll pop up in future episodes. Then there's the big overall season finale. It's like, that's all in this one movie. Yeah. It's like, that's a lot to deal with when you're not expecting that. Like, that's, that's a lot. Fair. That's fair. Though, on for me personally, I do see what you mean there. But the mm. thing is, on why that doesn't bother me personally is it does slow down around the second half when Zadob shows up. Like, gives you more time. At first, it's that balance of between dialogue and characters. And for a while, that bothered me, even as someone who's a fan of Ultraman. But then when I saw the twist on why that was happening, it was like, okay, it had to be this way. And then it made up for all that action by for most of that time on the second half, focusing on the plot and the characters. And that's something I really did enjoy as when it comes to the characters dynamic of Asami and Ultraman, Ultraman is a character who's mysterious for a while, but that's oh, the can I get into my thing before you start doing the character deep dives. Oh, okay. okay so I get, if you haven't done, I get carried away when I'm getting nerdy about you stuff. You do. You really do. Yeah. That's why I have to keep poking Fucking you. Like, whoa, nerd. wait, other people I'm need like, to get on the <laughs> Yeah, Cody, did you give your rating? I don't remember. He gave it a nine. Yeah, I yeah. gave it a nine. All right, so I, I follow me. A lot of things I say, again, I didn't watch a lot of the old Ultraman series, but something I always take into consideration with these is rewatchability and how it inspires or motivates me. Out of all the things we talked about today, I am more interested in paying attention to more Ultraman stuff. This movie actually got me thinking about other monster type things. How monsters? Oh yeah! It's like a funny, like an idea came to mind. It was probably, I think, a robot chicken sketch somewhere, or a Rick and Morty sketch. Is an alien race is dropping off a bunch of monsters, and humans keep killing them. But it's like, no, this monster, like we're sending this monster to help you, but we don't know that, so we keep killing them instead. Or it's like, oh, oops. And I think that's a funny idea for eventually. But like, so, oh no, you killed Macho Man Randy Savage. We sent yeah. you down for him to help you. Yeah, uh, damn it. Like, he, all right, you know Macho he'll, Man uh, will never die. No, like, here, we'll give them back. Bachelor oh, will help kill all the air pollution. It just shoots lightning in the sky, damages the sky. We kill Bachelor. It's like, no, he was going to make your air cleaner. Damn it. 
But that, yeah. that's a whole creative spin. Focusing yeah. on Shin Ultraman itself, I have a star on old Toho sound effects. Always love seeing those. A good yeah. update to the design of the kaiju. Because I've seen Ultraman monsters at like shops near me called Mitsua, at toy stores, at toy conventions. Ultraman monsters sell still. They keep making vinyl figures of them. And I'm able to recognize them. It's like, oh wow, they really update these really nicely. Um, they explain the they explain Ultraman's abilities well and why he flies oddly weird. Like I never understood why he's always in one pose when he flies and lands. Yeah. Like, oh, that kind of makes like okay, so he's just kind of manipulating things in a specific way. I'm like, and you're an alien, so you like, and you're an alien, so you see and work in gravity differently when you can free fly. Because at one point he's just doing like. 90 degree no not 90 degree, like 100 like what was it 360 degree spins in a weird direction and kicks them yeah. off yeah, <laughs> yeah like, that was weird as hell but i'm like you know what as someone who can manipulate gravity as easily as he can that makes sense you build up enough momentum and speed to make a bigger hit i'm like looks awkward but i'm like i guess makes sense but yeah i liked how they did that in the fighting um, the characters, I felt they were kind of connectable, a good balance of they were able to explain, come up with ideas and understand situations where usually when you, as a writer, I'm coming up with all the ideas and situations at once. But when I'm writing a story, I make multiple characters to have those voices to give everyone an idea. Like this was, this person pitches one idea. This person pitches another idea. This person comes up with why something happens. This one could explain another one. Like you have a good committee. I liked how they did that forgettable i don't remember any of their names but i still enjoyed them um what was it overall enjoyable shinji and alien speech pattern was funny but strange uh oh, and i said two hours a bit long condense like it feels like a condensed four or five episodes into a movie i got a bit tired at the one hour mark after like the second or third villain plot scheme as soon as i realized i'm like this is multiple plot schemes going into it i took a break at one point so I'm like, I'm tired. I need a break from some of this. So I didn't expect it to be like that. I thought it was going to be something like Shin Godzilla, one focused movie on a problem. I was like, no, this is multiple problems. Like, I need to take a break on some of these. Uh, but overall, I'd give it like a B plus, A minus. Would love more if, yeah, I would love it more if I was an Ultraman fan, but a good start to introduce you to like understanding the Ultraman mythos. Like, I would show this to my friend, and I told him, I was like, hey, there's a new Ultraman movie out. I, we never saw it as kids growing up. I want to show him this so he has an idea of what Ultraman is now. Ah, that's pretty cool. And I do agree with you on it being a um, good introduction point, because the thing is about Japan, like, this isn't the first reimagining of the original Ultraman in film. Like, there was also Ultraman the Next. That being a reimagining, there was a different approach. Unfortunately, while the Next is a fan favorite now, it failed when it originally was put into the theaters. Aww. But this movie in Japan, after everyone went to see it, it sparked a lot of discussion around the Next, and everyone was talking about it in Japan again because this movie, and that... I mean, that's good. If this can get a resurgence of Ultraman things, I don't know. I'll be more open to watching an Ultraman series if it comes out on television mm. or if they decide to make another movie or if they decide to bring it here like they did with Shin Godzilla, I'd be willing to go pay to see it in theaters knowing I'm like, okay, this is going to be like a show. So be mentally prepared for it. And I'll be like, and I'll be looking for more of the side things going into it. Cause I'm sure there's a bunch of things floating in the background or little knots of the old shows that I didn't notice at first either. Yeah, yeah. As something I was gonna say about Ultraman: The Next. So funny thing about that, that was never intended to be a movie series. Next was just supposed to be a film that starts out Ultraman Nexus. That's that yeah. was the whole purpose of it, and that's why, like, even though it didn't do so well, Nexus still happened anyway. It was because that's all it was supposed to be was like an introduction to the next Ultraman series. But what they tried to do instead was let's do a movie that starts it all off, in instead of doing like the series first and then doing a movie that comes halfway into a series. They did like it completely backwards. Like, like Tiga, for example, was a series first and then it had a movie. It had two movies. Nexus that came afterwards was like, we're going to do a movie first, Ultraman the next, and then we'll do Ultraman Nexus to finish it yeah. off. Yeah, exactly. 
But yeah, there's something I was about to say about um Ultraman in this movie. At first, I thought that, oh, you don't know anything about this guy, but that was the point for a while. He was supposed We were supposed to be wanting to find out who he is just as much as these people. Like, think about it. In the plot, these characters, while in Shin Godzilla, they were trying to find a way to stop Godzilla, here they were trying to understand what Ultraman is, which is why when Dadab ended up framing him for, do it, for causing destruction around the city, people didn't have this extreme reaction they did in the show because in the show they they already knew ultraman they saw them as saw him as their hero in this movie when it came to ultraman they were like oh what is this thing oh he seems to be helping us and oh look at this he's causing destruction um i guess he's not on our side so that's the thing we were supposed to be wanting to figure out who he is just as much as these characters were and i did really enjoy that throughout the journey you are slowly finding out who this guy is and what's his journey like you have a lot with the original ultraman with in the original ultraman shin hayata accidentally led to the ultraman ended up accidentally leading to the death of shin hayata and he ended up taking form and he ended up fusing with shin hayata to save his life which also benefited him in protecting the earth here he did something similar of leading to someone's death but he couldn't bring shin hayata back to life and the thing that makes that work so well is it helps an Ultraman not being so much of a perfect being of what the set of what a part of the theme of what this movie is going for because he made a mistake. He led to someone's death, though so he's just able to take form of the guy, and that's about it. And throughout the movie, when he, he is slowly becoming better with interacting with other people, and that's something yeah. I really did enjoy because at first. He just talks outlandish and alien-like because he doesn't understand how everything goes in our world and with people and such. So, after a while, he starts to slowly able to talk better with individuals. After Asami frees him from Zaba, Zadab, he uh, they they end up getting closer. They have a similar dynamic to um, Kyoko and Dando and Shin Godzilla. Only here is kind of a reimagining of Shin Hayata and. Fuji in the original Ultraman and as that goes he starts to talk more normal and this is this development is also a big help thanks to the actor's performance I forgot the actor's name but he did a very good job as when he's supposed to be more stoic and alien like he's more st he gives a more subtle performance while later brings a, a sense of humanity to it as this character learns as he goes along and the moment when he was talking to Zofi, I thought was a very solid way to introduce this, as it was just the right moment to show us on who this guy is and give us the detail that we need. And eventually he did make up for his mistake on leading to this guy's death because he decided to take his own life to simply bring this human being back. And also, in the end, it also helped the team feel a lot better and for speaking of the team what the two main characters are more on the complex side the team's more simple but that's good i like the simplicity of the team as it's kind of a nice drawback to the original show you have it where it comes to the drama of them like in ultraman there's usually always something more powerful that comes in his path and of course there's going to be drama when he's getting his ass kicked especially when he when he literally got fucking killed by zetton in the original series at the end. But here, um, you know that stress level that was shown with the politicians in Shin Godzilla? Like, how, how they're like, oh, shit's really getting bad. That's here because that hero, the only hope they had to protect him was getting his ass kicked by the Sajin. It shows that- Was he? Yeah, Wait, he did. What? Was, I mean, no, not the by the Sajin. He got his ass kicked by Zetton. Which was that again? The final kaiju. Zetton was the final kaiju in the Wait, was that the one in space? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was a monster. monster. I thought that was like a satellite. No, that's a no, monster. That's a monster. No, that he's looks like a satellite. I'll show you what Zeton looks like. Um, no, I look. Yeah. Like, I remember looking up. No, the I'll thing. show you what the original Zeton looks like. I, I saw what it looked like because while I was watching the movie, I re I realized they're using names from of the monsters in the actual show. So I looked it up. I'm like, yeah, I got that. But in okay. the movie, it looked like a giant satellite. Well, yeah, That's that part was, of what I was talking about earlier when I said Anno made some changes to the yeah, like, I wasn't his own getting, spin to the mythos. Yeah, yeah, like I wasn't getting a monster. I'm getting this is just a device. Like this is yeah. a machine the ultra people have. 
Yeah, I, I didn't get that vibe because I already knew who Zeton was. And it still yeah. looked like Zeton, but more outlandish. Not one of my favorite designs, to be honest. But still, I see what uh, Ano and Higuchi were going it, for. It, it looked like Zeton was T-posing in space the entire time, but just in a very <laughs> special way. I mean, yeah. what he's doing is like, I, I, did, like, I did understand where it's like, all right, I saw the energy. I saw the orange things on the chest. I saw the face. I'm like, this thing is just a weird looking satellite. I never understood that as a kaiju. So as someone who doesn't know Ultraman things, that might have gotten lost in translation somewhere. Oh, okay, fair enough. But as I was about to say, um, the characters, we get to see them through a life crisis. Like when it comes to the other two, like when it comes to the team, Yumi, the cutesy, the cutesy girl with glasses, it was adorable how she was just eating a bunch of chocolate, like a bunch of candy and stuff she as snacks. her comfort. Yeah, a bunch of snacks. That was cute. And mm -hmm. it brought a more lighthearted nature to this overall. Don't learn smoke pot. Yeah, dark situation. Mm. And then you had people on the team that was smoking to kind of get their aggression gone. S similar to how um Dando Yaguchi and Shin Godzilla needed a water to calm down. You had that here. Because think about being put in that team's place of their only, their, the only help they had to stop the other monster has got his fucking ass kicked by Zetton. So that's... I liked how one of them legitimately on. said like they were pointless. Because yeah. you know what? That's a real explanation in that, like, someone had to be saying that somewhere. Where it's like, yeah. no, I have hope. And it's like, no, our greatest hope, a god lost. There's nothing we can do. And exactly. he was just demoralized. Yeah. But that's the thing I like about the characters. They all had their own personality traits. Um, and they all had their own place in the plot. And at the mm -hmm. end, when everything got bad... They, they you know, reacted accordingly. It was nice. Like I said, it was present in other Ultra shows, but Ano took it to a more realistic level, which is something he's really good at. Mm -hmm. And the thing about okay, Shin Godzilla, I like, like, every, there's, I know there's a lot of things I went on about this movie, like the balance of you Kaiju. Go on to Shin Godzilla a lot, let's be honest. Huh? We always go back to Shin Godzilla somewhere. Well, yeah, but the thing about this, though, is when it comes to Shin Godzilla, it's a reflection on the sweats being adapted. Shin mm -hmm. Godzilla was a mix that uh, was more focused on the dialogue than Kaiju because Gojira was very dark and focused on the themes around it. This is more balanced between Kaiju and characters because Ultra, the original Ultraman was more balanced. So Ultraman in general tends to be. And the ending is more light in the blend of humor that comes in. Was it light? I, I was kind of confused with the ending. I, the I, ending I thought is Ultraman died, but... The ending is bittersweet because okay. essentially how he gave his life to bring that one dude back. I forgot his name because Should the you... thing is, this way, he wasn't yeah. really the character in the movie. Uh, he was Kamigawa. Just Kamigawa, yeah, Kata, I believe. Yeah, Kanagawa. He wasn't the character we were looking at. The character we were looking at was Ultraman. It's basically like, when you see Superman, you don't think of him as fucking Clark Kent. Okay, when you see Clark Kent, you don't think of him as fucking Superman. You see it as fucking Superman. Yeah. But that's the thing about here is it, he gave his life to not only give that guy, have let that guy survive, but also to make the crew happy. We had something more bittersweet. Well, at the end of Shin Godzilla, since they established that Godzilla is limitless in that movie, whenever something stronger, whenever something threatening comes his way, he will evolve into a way to combat it. Mm -hmm. They state that in the movie. He is Shin Godzilla is limitless. So yeah. at the end, after everything seems good, you have those things on his tail. Here you had a more bittersweet thing that while Ultraman is dead, they, he gave life to the individual he ended up leading to the death of, and which also, since the team thought he was Ultraman... Seems like a bit of a downgrade, honestly. Yeah, but they're not gonna they're not gonna know. So there is No, they're gonna that's know that's like, wait, so you're back? It's like, yeah. Okay, so we lost Ultraman, so what do we do? Well the thing is I think when it came to the ending of it is implying that with their happiness, like if you don't remember, everyone was happy at the end of the movie. Yeah, because cause they're he like, was alive, but we didn't show like they were happy, he was alive. We never yeah. got the 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 next conversation the conversation of is it you? Are you still Ultraman? Yeah, but that's something Ano and Higuchi tend to do with all their works, and I'm not joking, all, okay. or at least the majority of their works, they leave room for what happens next um, to kind of bring of to kind of bring conversation of what goes on. They yeah, leave stuff fair. like leaving room for sequels and other ideas or offshoot ideas. Hey guys, I gotta go real quick, so I'll uh, I'll be back in a little while, all right?
Sounds good. I think we might be done soon enough. Anyway. Wrapping up, yeah. yeah. Parents got like a little bit of mercy. You need to help out with some. Go for uh, okay. it, Hooper. Nice meeting you. Yeah, it was nice meeting you too, guys. Stay I'm awesome. Great having you. But yeah, um, th- that's the thing about the ending. It was more bittersweet while also having somewhat of the ambiguous thing that Ano and Higuchi has in all their works. Evangelion had it. Shin Godzilla had it. This had it too. Only difference is while those endings were more nihilistic, this ending, while ambiguous was on the bittersweet side yeah and honestly if it, like, if they decide to make another or continue with something else they left it open for that and that's kind of one of the things where it's like i like that because even in the 2014 godzilla movie where godzilla goes back to the ocean it lets it off with like that could have been a standalone movie or they could have done a sequel and when i saw the 2014 movie i started to write my own godzilla story based off of that, of what happens after he goes back into the ocean. And I called it Godzilla Alpha Predator. I made a whole series about it for like the next five plus years. And I really loved it. This kind of makes me want to do an Ultraman series of what happens next of now that either Ultraman is around or isn't around the monster, the kaiju are going to keep popping up and alien races are now aware of humanity where it's like, Oh, Aliens are now showing up. We still need support. Like, we still yeah. need something to combat this. Well, yeah, that's the appeal of these ambiguous endings Ano brings, because they're not sequel bait. Um, They intend for stuff to be ambiguous, because the end of Evangelion had that. Um, Shin Godzilla, Higuchi even stated they had no intent for a Shin Godzilla sequel when doing it's, that. It's worse. So- yeah, so that's the appeal of it, is letting the viewer get somewhat of an idea of what's happening while leaving room for our imagination to form what happens next. Which is why I like this, because it gives me that idea of like, wow, I'm interested in Ultraman now. I'm interested in making an idea going off it. I have a bunch of Jack Jaguar figures, thanks to his repopularity. I'm like, I could do some with that spun into it. Hell, humanity could make their own version of Ultraman based on whatever they have floating around and the schematics of it. Where it's like, all right, oh, that's right, they have the science of it somewhere. So it's like, all right, let's try and build our own Ultraman. And then it goes on to something else, or however people want to do it. But yeah, uh, like, I liked it. It was fun. Yeah. And also, I would like, I almost forgot to mention this, but the music was really good. If you like that blend of sound, old and new sound effects from Shin Godzilla, you'll love it here. You have new sound effects, like you have a lot of classic Ultraman scores done in a modern way, and along with some new tracks. You even get one, uh, at least one of the tracks from Shin Godzilla in this movie. And I was able mm. to point that out because it was overall a very nice little drawback and use of the score, but it wasn't mm. lazy because they made something new along those lines. I guess you could kind of compare it with what Shido Hai... Shido... Dude, Shido Tell actually... he uses stuff all the time. Let's be honest. That's yeah, kind I of forgot, their forte. I, you I don't need to explain name. that. <laughs> yeah, I forgot his name, but Shido something, Sagusu, mm-hmm. something like that. I'm probably butchering his name because I ain't remembering it, but he's kind of like Akita Ife, Ifakube as th- he makes new versions of his really good older scores, and I really mm-hmm. enjoyed that. You have a balance of old stuff and new stuff to really keep things interesting, and I did like that. The kaiju were all really awesome, badass redesigns of old school stuff, and the fights in general were really good. And I gotta say how good the effects were. Like, when he's when Ultran's lifting up a dead kaiju, you could really, like in the original show, here with the modern effects capabilities, you could really feel that monster's weight going down on his shoulders, and I just really dig that detail put into it. Yeah. Uh, I'm out. Uh, like I, like I said, I went through it. Cody, you got anything else? There's actually a whole lot I could talk about. I mean, I did a. I know I did that big old sum up of what I thought, but there's a lot of things I could go into deeper if I really yeah, wanted to. No, I can't because we'll be here for another hour, and it's already two hours as is. And no disrespect intended at all, but I want to go and do other stuff now. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. Anyway, you would like to go into the basics, or are you good? Um, I, so I'll say a few of the things that I wanted to say. First of all, haha, I see what did with Gomez at the beginning. That was cute. Kind of wish that he had stuck around, because even though what, the way they were using him made sense, just the way he looked, his presentation, it honestly seemed to me like it would have taken a greater force than the Japanese self-defense forces to take him down. But even still, I know we had to move 
move the movie's plot along. Maybe I'm just biased because of the fact that, yes, Gomez is based off Godzilla, and they used the Shin Godzilla CG model for him. It was... Yeah. And so, because of that, I think of Godzilla as being so mighty that he can't be taken down that easily, so that's why I might have felt Gomez shouldn't have been taken down as easily as he was. But, you know, that is what it is. The music made me laugh because of the fact that how uh, unapologetically they were using so not fitting, but at the same time very fitting muse, classic music from the Ultraman show in some scenes. There was even one point where they added like a guitar riff to an old Ultraman track in here and had it playing with the old goofy kids show music and I'm just like oh that's so awesome. And uh, I think one of the aliens should have at least used uh, Kaiju to at least uh, stall Ultraman while they did their evil alien plot. Because if you notice, once the aliens come in, the Kaiju just sort of disappeared. I don't think they should have done that personally. And And also, I was uh, surprised by how long it took Ano to... In, inject his well on ness because while he does play everything straight for the most part like he tends to do he didn't start doing zany like he can also do a la event and get like we had a giant tommy walk through the through the streets of tokyo i'm just like the Ano we know with his what the fuckery and um i guess uh all the fight scenes were awesome. I thought they were all badass. I wanted more out of them, but I think, but I mean that in a good way. They left me wanting more because they were so well done. Also, meaningless fanboy gripe. We got no shoo-watch or any regular Ultraman battle cries, which I was hoping they would add in. But, you know, yeah, they didn't that is what it is. Those, like, karate sound effects. I was surprised by that. It's just yeah, like, especially- where's my shoo-watch, damn it? Yeah. And uh, I guess I'll say, uh, you notice how Otto really likes the name Shinji? I mean, his best friend who directed this, let's be honest, Otto was the one in charge of this, even if Shinji Higuchi's name is director, his name director on this. We all know he's just a puppet for Otto. In addition <laughs> to that, there's Shinji from the Evangelion series. And then we, the main protagonist of this show, of this movie, is named Shinji. It's like, what is your obsession, Anno? Tell us well, the truth. Let, let me give you some interesting trivia on that. At least for Shinji and Evangelion's case, he was named after Shinji Higuchi, since Higuchi is his, his best friend. Aha! Uh-huh. That's probably the case here. Well then, and also, every, this may be the preferred side of me coming out, but... Uh, when I every time I saw a Savi slapping her butt, whatever, I'm just like, you know, it's beautiful. That's why you keep slapping it. Thank you. I thought the same fucking thing. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I know this backside's good, so it's gotta be good luck. Yeah. And, oh god. And what's the? <laughs> is there anything else I could add? Um. Again. Giant man go bam, bam, boom, boom against giant monsters and giant aliens. So lots of fun there. Yeah. But yeah, as a whole, very good. Definitely mm-hmm. everything I wanted from the from the original Ultraman getting the Shin treatment. Looking forward to seeing what they'll do with Kamen Rider. Kamen Rider, the original Rider series, from what I understand, is horror. So it's going to be interesting to see him put that to screen. Indeed. But y'all have anything else to say? I'm out. Uh, I've said my piece with it. Shut! With that said, please comment your thoughts down below. And if you enjoyed it, please smash that like button, share it around, and subscribe. Make sure to hit that bell for notifications to keep up to date on all my future content. Also, if you want to watch these live, check out the Twitch channel. That's in the link in the description down below. Alongside my social medias and alt tech. This is Gojin the Makai Phantom. I'm leaving the building. Bye bye. Stay off some folks.